Well, there is a three-word phrase. It's like the DNA, the battle cry of this church. And when I ask for it here in a second, and if you can't say it, if you've been around here for any time at all, I, I'm going to be heartbroken. Okay, what, what is our church all about? Three words. People need Jesus. And so this series that we're on right now, Who is Jesus? The I Am Sayings of Jesus. This is mission critical stuff. This gets to the heart of the why of why we do everything we do. And so I, I love sharing this with you. I love delving into the truth in John's gospel with you because Jesus is the bread of life. Without him, we are hungry and empty. Jesus is the light of the world. Without him, we stumble in the darkness. Jesus is the gate of the sheep. Without him, we, we don't have access and safety. Jesus is the good shepherd. And it's not just that we'll be a lost sheep. We're going to fall into the hands of some bad shepherds if we don't follow the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And we've been going more or less chronologically through the Gospel of John. And we're going to break our pattern uh, today because last week we were in John 10. In John 11, Jesus does something so big and so revolutionary that this is, John tells us this is really the thing where people decide, okay, we got to kill this guy. We got to get rid of him somehow. And that thing was he raised a guy named Lazarus from the dead who had been in the tomb for four days. And, uh, and as Jesus got ready to do that, he gave one of these I am statements that I'm, we're going to stick that in our pocket, okay? And we're going to hold on to that for two weeks. And we're going to pull it out on Easter Sunday, okay? Uh, because we, we've got to delve into that, that Jesus said in that setting. But, but you know, when we're, we're in John 14 now. And, you know, John 12 is a triumphal entry. And by the time we get in John 14, we are in the last... Uh, we're in the last 48 hours of Jesus' life. So we've jumped ahead here quite a bit. And, uh, you know, John 14 is one of those, uh, is one of those passages that you're going to know it when you hear it. If you don't know it, just, okay, know what John 14 is. When you hear the words, you'll recognize the words. We read them over and over again at a funeral. Okay, there's number one text you're going to hear at a funeral. That's the 23rd Psalm. But close after that is John 14 because there's assurance in it. There's, there's promises in it. There's eternity in it. And so we read that a lot. But we often pull John 14 out of its context and we treat it kind of floating out on its own. And we really have to understand the setting, I think, to really get a hold of this. So I'm going to start in John 13. Before Grady comes and reads our passage to you, I just want you to know that the, I want you to get a feel for this moment because it, it, it's significant. Let's look at John 13, 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So, so it's Passover time. It's Holy Week. Jesus is, uh, he knows that his time has come. He's, he's come from the Father. He's going to the Father. And this will be his last time with his disciples. Now, John is going to take us to the table, and he's going to leave us there for 13, 14, 15, 16. He's, there's several chapters there that are Jesus' teaching. But this is Jesus' last, this is the rabbi's last time to teach his disciples. And so it's weighty and it's important. It's urgent for Jesus. And you know what it says? He loved his, his own and he loved them to the end. You know, sometimes we, we kind of talk about Jesus and the disciples, and he's the teacher, and they're like the knuckleheads, and, you know, and he's trying to teach them stuff, and they're like, duh, they're going, you know, let's fight over something stupid, and, and we kind of get that kind of, well, Jesus is like, oh, I'm going to hang out with these morons, you know. That's not how, but Jesus is, John is so clear that Jesus loves these guys. Jesus loved the disciples. He loved them to the end. I love that, that John makes that, a clear, that clear, that everything Jesus, all the interactions he had come out of, of, of love. He loved the disciples, loved them to the end. Let's see what else it says in John 13. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So there's a dark thread, right? Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. So Judas' betrayal is mentioned. That's, that's part of this, this meal that they're having. But Jesus knew where it came from, knew where he was going. So Jesus is confident 
uh, of, what he's, uh, of where he's at and what he's doing. But he does something out of that confidence that nobody expected. He took, he took off his outer garments, tied a towel around his waist, and he began to wash feet, to wash the feet of the disciples. And Peter's going to object, and, and uh, this was the job for the lowliest of servants. If you had like five servants in the house, the, it would be the job that the lowest ranking one got, because no, who wants to wash feet? Raise your hand if you've ever been part of a Christian foot washing ceremony. Okay. Several of you have. Boy, awkward, isn't it? it it's awkward. It, it's, I've been on both sides of that. I've been the foot washer and the foot wash e. And I think if I had to choose, I may choose the foot washer over the foot wash e, just because you're like, oh, my, my feet stink, and oh, I'm sorry, and oh, this is, you're having to wash my feet. And, you know, and, oh, I got a, a little bit of lint there between the one that went to the market and the one that stayed home, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's just, it's just, you know, it's just like, oh, it's, it's just, a, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's humbling. It's humbling for the one doing the foot washing, and it's humbling for the one that's receiving the, the foot washing. But Jesus said you're supposed to do this. You're, you're, I've washed your feet. You're supposed to wash it. And, you know, and Peter objects, and, and so he's going around there. This is not on anybody's script for how the evening was going to go. This was totally, out, this was totally different, and, and they just couldn't believe it was happening. So that's part of it. And we're going to jump forward. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. Now, uh, Jesus wasn't like a, he was a pretty even-keeled guy. There were times where he got very emotional. He cleansed the temple and all that. But, uh, but Jesus was pretty even-tempered. And here he's upset. You know, when someone you love is upset, you're upset, right? Because, you know, it's just, it's just troubling. And so they're seeing Jesus get upset. And I don't think they knew why he was upset. And that's even worse. You know, if you know why somebody's upset, you at least understand. But Jesus here is troubled in spirit at the Last Supper. Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. This is out of his love for them. One of his guys is going to betray him. His disciples stared at one another at the loss to know which of them he meant. They were at a loss. They didn't know what to do. You know, that, that, had that moment last Sunday... Uh, did, did Will Smith go up and just slap Chris Rock in the face? And all these starlets and all these Hollywood are like, what am, I, what, what am I supposed to even do with my face right now? Or what even is supposed to be happening right now? It was just like nobody saw that one coming, you know? And so, and so it's, the, their faces are looking like that a little bit. They're like, uh, we, don't, we don't even know. Let's read on here. Um, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus said, I'm no longer going to be with you. Um, you know, uh, the number one thing Jesus asked his disciples to do was follow me. That was like the original contract they had with Jesus, right? Follow me. And, and he went to, you know, the Sea of Galilee. There's Peter, James, John. Follow me. They left businesses. They left uh, longstanding family succession plans. They left family. They left livelihoods. And they followed him. They signed on with this Messiah and, and, and you kind of have to think, you know, what was the script they had in their head of how the thing was supposed to go, you know? They, they, they believed in Jesus, they're going to follow him, they believe he's the Messiah, uh, and he's going to continue a spiritual renewal in Israel <clears throat> that John the Baptist really started. And at some point, we're not really clear how this is going to happen, but at some point I think they thought that that spiritual renewal was going to turn into a political renewal, and Jesus was some, going to somehow end up in charge, and they were going to end up in charge behind him. I think they kind of had that expectation. This is how it was supposed to go. And when Jesus said, I'm going to go and you cannot follow, that's like their number one thing of what they were supposed to do, right? That was the script. And so Peter is, is just bewildered by this. Let's put that up on the screen. Peter says, um, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And I guess Peter kind of thought, well, maybe you're going to do something dangerous or something. So maybe, maybe you're trying to spare us that. So he wanted to make it clear that he was in for the long haul. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you, Jesus. <laughs> and then Jesus answered, um, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. In other words, before the sun comes up, which is in about eight hours, you're going to manage to deny that you know me um, three times. Wow. So I want you to get the, get the feeling in the room. You sense the heaviness? 
You know, Jesus says to the disciples, I want you to, a new commandment I give you, you to love one another. And we sometimes pull that one out as a, as a separate verse and we memorize it and, and that's cool. But in the context of the Last Supper, when Jesus is saying all this stuff, when Jesus says, I, I want you to love one another as I have loved you, it, it hits different. Uh, for instance, let's say you're a um, 10-year-old boy and... Uh, your dad's getting ready to leave for work for the day, and he pats you on the head, and he says, son, I love you. I want you to uh, listen to your mom, and I want you to take care of your brothers and sisters. Okay, dad, yeah, I, I got it. And dad goes off to work. That, that's one thing. But then when, let, let's have a little different scenario. Dad has chest pains. He falls to the floor. The little boy comes to his side, and he says, I want you to take care of your brothers and sisters. That's different, right? That hits different. There's a finality to that. And when Jesus says, I want you to love one another, it kind of has the ring like, I'm not going to be here to love you like I have loved you. It's going to be different now, and you need to love one another. So just, just, just kind of sense the, the pall that falls over that whole, that whole thing. And that is the context of John 14, 1. Grady, come on up here, man. And... Uh, I'm going to have everybody stand, if you would, please, for the reading of God's Word. Hear the word, of God, hear the word of God, the Gospel according to John, chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe, you believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Grady. Let not your heart be troubled. Why do you think he said that? John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Their hearts were troubled. That word trouble uh, means uh, shaken. I think about what, um, you know, Peter uh, told, Jesus told Peter, he said, hey, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, to shake you out, man. And, uh, and, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have repented, when you have been converted, one version says, when you have returned, strengthen your, your brother. There's a shaking that's going on in this la these last moments of Jesus' life on earth. A lot of hearts are going to be revealed. Let not your heart be troubled. And, and what is the foundation of that? It, all this is going to change. Jesus is not going to be with them and their, their whole job description is going to change and, and, and there's a betrayer in their midst and they don't know who it is and there's a lot of reasons to be troubled. What, what's, the, what's the reason to be confident here? Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. It's based in faith. You believe in God, believe also in me. I want you to throw your anchor onto me. I, my, my promises, I want you to throw my, your anchor onto my word. I want you to throw your anchor onto my miracles, the things you have seen, the track record you have for me, because so much is going to change. When everything's changing, you've got to throw your anchor onto the thing that does not change. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's how you're going to let not your heart be troubled. And then he says this promise, in my Father's house are many rooms. Uh, the old King James Version says mansions, and we kind of thought, well, okay, there's a street of gold, and there's some high-priced real estate on that. I'm going to get one of those, I'm going to get one of those big McMansions in the sky, you know. That, that, that's not the image that Jesus is painting, the palette that Jesus is painting with here. He's, he's, he's talking about relationship. He said, I'm going to the Father, but I, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, Jesus is really clear with his disciples. He does not promise them an easy life. He does not promise them smooth sailing. But he is going to promise them a safe landing. Okay, I go to prepare a place for you. All of John 13, if Jesus talks about the Father and his work and, and, and the love, it's all relationship language. And Jesus continues that here in John 14 when he says, My Father's house, I go to prepare a place. 
You know, there's so many, I, you know, I've heard interpreters, you know, talk about, you know, the weddings back then, how they did it. You know, it, the parents kind of arranged all the marriages back then. You want to go back to that? That was kind of, I, I don't know uh, if that would be a good thing or not. But uh, two sets of parents would get together and say, my son's going to marry your daughter. And, uh, and they would arrange the details of that. And there was usually a dowry. There was a price that was paid by the groom's family. And they'd negotiate all that, which is interesting, you know, how much, how much uh, they're going to pay. And, uh, and then uh, the groom would actually go away at that point. And the expectation was that he would go and prepare a place for his bride. He would, uh, he would make sure they had a house to live in and, and get established. And so he had something to invite her into. And so uh, when that was in place, he would come back and say, I have prepared a place for you. And now I'm coming to receive you that where I am, you can be too. And there'd be a... a a marriage ceremony and there'd be a consummation and, and there's some of that echo that's in this language. I go to prepare a place for you. Um, and, and where I am, you will be also. Now, I love Thomas. You gotta love Thomas, right? You know, Jesus said, well, you know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas is so, so honest. He's so outspoken. You know, he's the guy that... Uh, he was missing when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to his disciples. Thomas wasn't there. And so he comes back from McDonald's, you know, he was out. out. And, uh, and they're saying, we saw Jesus, he's alive, he's with us. And Thomas said, no, no, no. Unless I, I put my fingers in the nail prints on his hand, unless I put my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. And about a week later, Jesus had to appear another time to the disciples and say, Thomas, come here, put your, put your fingers in the nail prints in my hand, put your hand in my side, don't be doubting, but believe. We call him Doubting Thomas. But you know what, Thomas, you've got to give him some credibility. He's, a, he's the uh, one who said for the first time, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. So he's an honest, he's an honest broker here. I, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. What in the world are you talking about, Jesus? And that's when Jesus drops this one. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas Akempis uh, wrote The Imitation of Christ in about 1400 A.D. And, uh, and German guy, and, but, but he's, this quote is attributed to him. Jesus, you are the way. Without you, there is no going. You are the truth. Without you, there is no knowing. You are the life. Without you, there is no living. I just want to riff on that a little bit here. Jesus is the way. You know, the very first name for the Christians as a separate group was the way. If you look in the early chapters of the book of Acts, they were first called Christians at Antioch. And basically, when the gospel spilled out into the Gentile world, they needed a new name for these people because they were before considered just Jewish people of a particular stripe. But when the Gentiles started to come in, they needed a name. They called them Christians. It was a derogatory term, I am sure, Christians. These people that talk, talk about Christ all the time. Um, but the, the older term for Christians was followers of the way. Jesus says, I am the way. And they call themselves, who are we? We are, this is what they call themselves. We're followers of the way. Oh, the way is to be, is, is a path to be followed. Uh, anybody watch the Mandalorian? It's kind of a, it's kind of a Star Wars kind of thing. And you, you've got some Mandalorian watchers in here. You know, and Mandalorian, he's kind of a, he's kind of a killer kind of guy. He kills people. But they're it's part of this, kind of this religious order too, which is kind of interesting. And they have expectations. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, one of those is to care for orphans and all this. And, and, and sometimes there'll be, some of these are kind of onerous at times, these demands of their, their, their group. And so they'll say this to one another. Well, this is the, this is the way, right? They'll, they'll say that this is, this is the way, this is how we do. This is, we're, we're, we're followers of this way and we're going to walk in this way. And Jesus says, I am the way to the father. And then he says, I am the truth. And truth is a uh, Truth is a uh, big theme in John's gospel. You know, very famously, Jesus is going to appear before Pontius Pilate uh, during his trial uh, here at a, a few chapters later. And Jesus is saying that he's coming to testify to the truth. And very cynically, Pilate's going to say, what is truth? I think, I think uh, Pilate was the first postmodern, okay? 
What is truth? You got your truth. I got my truth. My truth has the Roman legions behind it. So I like my truth better than your truth. And that's the, that's the day we live in. You know, you got your truth. I got my truth. Let me tell you what. There is no your truth. There is no my truth. There is the truth. Jesus didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way. He didn't say, I know the way. He said, I am the way. And he doesn't say, I, I know the truth or can show you the truth or can tell you the truth. He says, I am the truth. John 1 says he is full of grace and truth. In John 4, Jesus talks about worship. And he says, those that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. In John chapter 8, Jesus gives this word, you will know the truth. And what's it going to do? It's going to set you free. It's going to set you free. Lies keep you bound up. The truth sets you free. And Jesus says, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and I am the life. The life. You know, in John, eternal life isn't later. Eternal life happens when you receive Jesus Christ. John 5, Jesus says, those who believe in me have passed from death to life. You get, you're in eternal life now. And eternity is a continuation of that relationship. It bugs me to no end that we, we think about heaven and, and you know, we think about the place. The, it's an all-inclusive resort, right, that you hope to get to one day. But the whole point of heaven is... It's the Father's house. God's the best thing about heaven. It's not, the, it's not the cuisine. It's not the rest. It's not the clouds. It's not the angels. It's not the scenery. It, it, you know, it's not even you get to see mama again. The best thing about heaven is that it's the Father's house. And Jesus says there's a, there's a, there's a room with your name on it because of your relationship with me. And I used to think about heaven this way. You know, I think, okay, there's heaven, there's hell. I kind of sitting in church, back, back row, Cash Chapel, United Methodist Church, okay. And how this must work is you die, and, you know, okay, we're all going to die. That's kind of a hard thing for a kid to kind of realize. You know, the death rate is hovering around 100% somewhere. You know, it's like, uh, and it's like okay, okay, I'm going to die one day, and I've done some good stuff, I've done some bad stuff. So it must be like a big scale in the sky. You know, you put all the bad stuff I've done on one side, unfortunate. You put all the good stuff I've done on one side, and, you know, if it balances out, you know, on the good side more than the bad side. Or maybe God grades on the curve. You know, I'm not perfect. Okay, I'll just admit that. We'll just put that on the table. Not perfect, messed up. But, you know, compared to how Clark, how am I doing? You know, am I, you know, am I, I'm doing okay with, you know... <clears throat> And uh, that's a very human-centered approach to heaven. And Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He blows that whole thing out of the, out of the water. And he says, this is about relationship. It's not about rules. This is about grace. It's not about performance. I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. You're not going to get where I'm going on your own steam. You're going to get there out of the fullness of your relationship with me. Thanks be to God. And, and I'm the one that's brought you this far. And disciples, here's what I want you to hear. I'm going to take you the rest of the way. And it's not going to be based on your doing and your striving. It's going to be based on this relationship. Your, the way that you're following, the the, the truth that you're living, the, the life that you're walking in. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. This is what Jesus wanted the disciples 2,000 years ago to know at the Last Supper at the table. And we're coming to the table right now, and I think it's the thing that Jesus wants us to know here at 2022. He wants us to know that our, our future is based on our relationship with Him. It's based on His love for us, His grace for us. And it, it's not a, you know, how am I doing in my performance? It's based on Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. No one's going to come to where I'm going except through me. Would you prepare your hearts to come to the table today? I want to ask you, is your heart troubled today? I bet it is. We live in, weird, in a weird time, in a weird culture, in a weird world. A lot of the rules are changing. A lot of, the, a lot of things are, are different than what they used to be. I bet your heart's troubled. You probably have some family situations, some life situations. 
Uh, I bet you have some struggles going on right now. Maybe there's some financial struggles. You've got some bills you don't know how you're going to pay. Maybe there's some uh, a, a prodigal in your life. You're hoping that you don't know what's going to happen to them or someone that's in genuine danger. A lot of reasons for your heart to be troubled. But I want you to hear the Lord Jesus say, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. No matter what changes, here's one thing that's not changing. I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come again. And I'm going to receive you to myself. And that relationship that we have with Jesus is going to thrive on through all of eternity by his grace in the Father's house. Jesus, we thank you for your truth today. You are the truth. You don't just have truth. You are the truth. You don't just know the way. You, you are the way. You don't just show us life. You, you are the life. And that's our confidence for living. That's the anchor point against the storm. On the night you gave yourself up for us, you took bread, you broke the bread, you gave it to your disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, likewise, you took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to your disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice. We receive the promises of the Lord Jesus. We let not our heart be troubled. We trust him for the future. We thank you, Jesus, that you've gone to prepare a place for us and that you'll receive us unto yourself. Pour your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine this meal of uh, remembrance of your promises, your love, your way, your truth, your life. Uh, help us to be living as your body here on this earth and gather us all to that table where your saints feast forever in the Father's house. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. He taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.